introducing our first speaker of the day, which is Dr. Nicholas Steers. And he's gonna be telling us a little bit about resident and recruited macrophages in bladder health and disease. So good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about residents and recruited macrophages in bladder health and disease. So I'll start by giving an overview of macrophages and tissue resident macrophages. So macrophages are as a myeloid cell compartment in the steady state, which is no infection or no immunological challenge and is very um, heterogeneous and comprises cells of diverse origins and functions. Um, these cells are mononuclear phagocytes, such as macrophages and dendritic cells, and they play um, vital roles in tissue homeostasis. And these cells were first described by Ian Mashnikov in the 19th century and actually published his first paper on macrophages 130 years ago. Um, early studies suggest that macrophages are part of a discrete mononuclear phagocyte system, which are continually replenished by bud mono, monocytes. Um, and tissue resident macrophages are a diverse family found in most organs, and they can comprise up to 10% of the total cell population in every single organ. And examples of very well studied tissue macrophages are brain microglia, liver cupper cells, lung alveolar macrophages, and uh, Langerhan cells. So these cells, macrophages, um, they uptake debris, foreign substances um, such as infectious diseases, cancers, and dying cells. And these cells are capable of controlling the immune response by secreting both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines and other immune mediators. And they play critical roles in immunity, muscle regeneration, wound healing, tissue homeostasis, and iron homeostasis. And this is a picture of macrophages taken by the Cavendish Lab at University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. So tissue residual macrophages, these are self-maintained in adult tissues, independently of the hemopoietic stem cells under steady state conditions. And mechanisms for responsible generation of macrophage diversity in adult mice remains unclear. Um, paradigms in immunology are always shifting. And now it's been demonstrated in certain tissues, there's a critical role for adult monocytes to replenish the resident macrophages and this has been confirmed in tissues such as the gut, the dermis, and the heart. And notably within these tissues, the older the mice get, there's a much more increase um, of the replenishment from blood mononuclear, blood mononuclear cells, blood monocytes. And this parallels with the loss of macrophages derived from embryonic sources. So across all organs, there's a long lived tissue resin macrophages. And these have a list of core responsibilities to maintain um, homeostatic functions. And examples of this would be, um, have been demonstrated very clearly um, in, the, in the brain, the lung, the heart, the liver, intestines, and bone marrow. And these have core functions. For example, in the lung and the air liquid air um, interface, these macrophage, alveolar macrophages are responsible for uptaking bacteria and viruses in the lung, sorry, in the liver with um, listeria infection, um, cut for cells basically die um, to restrict the infection. And what macrophages do, they basically form a barrier for, of inflammation so we don't have excessive inflammation within the tissues. However, um, as I mentioned, these have been well described in the majority of tissues, but there's limited information in the bladder. As you can see, the picture taken from this review by Park et al. Uh, in cell uh, last month, um, we have the brain, lung, heart, liver, intestine, bone marrow, but there's no real data on the kidney or the bladder. So we don't know the unique um, functions of the cells in these tissues. We don't know unique cues to, to keep maintain these cells. For example, uh, um, in microglia um, are maintained by IL-3 uh, and IL-13, which are secreted by astrocytes in the brain. And this helps maintain the tissue resident macrophages. So um, within the bladder, we know the origin comes from macrophages derived from the yolk sac, from the fetal liver and the bone marrow. And, but the kinetics of replenishment is unknown and it's the differences between male and female mice. Uh, this is a picture taken um, from Max et al in science and it's showing basically um, the, the rights of the macrophages derived from the yolk sac in, in the brain, lung, liver, uh, the kidney and the, and the epidermis. And these are the unique transcription factors. Um, during the development, um, we have macrophages derived from the yolk sac, the fetal liver, and the, um, and the bone marrow. And what, what happens is that eventually over time, there's gonna be a, um, about a 50-50 split between macrophages um, derived from the embryonic stages versus um, the bone marrow. 
Um, however, within the, um, within the bladder, uh, we do know that fecal macrophage from the yolk sac are not present after um, just around birth. And actually the, within the adult, their macrophages derive from um, the fecal liver and the bone marrow in the steady state. And this is taken from a review, um, which Indira and I wrote, um, thanks to the Caribou uh, Interaction course. So um, what we want to do is we want to um, understand the role of macrophages in the steady state and controlling tissue homeostasis and immunity. And we also want to understand at some point the difference, sex differences between the male and female mice, because sex hormones play a critical role in, in immunity. Um, previous work I did in peritoneal cavity and macrophages, we saw that male macrophages are more proliferative, where macrophages derived from female mice are more um, inflammatory. So initially what we did, we did a brief phenotypic analysis of bladder, spleen, red pulp, and parental cavity and macrophages in eight week female C57 black six mice. And we have um, bladder, spleen, and peritoneal cavity. We have the F480 um, high population. And what we can see is when we look at the MHC class two expression, we can see a difference where bladder tissue resin macrophages are class two high, where resin macrophages in splenic red pulp or the peritoneal cavity are class two low. So we start seeing differences in the peritoneal in the resin macrophage population. And so what we wanted to do, we want to understand this further. So what we've done, we've developed um, a deep phenotyping panel for bladder macrophages to look at the populations in mice. And to do this, uh, we use flow cytometry, we use a Cytec Aurora, which is capable of looking up to 40 different fluorochromes or markers. And we've developed a 32 fluorochrome panel just look at mac the macrophage population. So all these markers will bind um, on, the, on the macrophage cell. We also have certain markers um, to exclude um, T cells, B cells, neutrophilic cells, and, and neutrophils. So we can sort of exclude those from our analysis. Um, we've isolated macrophages from the bladder of C57 black six mice both in the steady state and response to a urinary tract infection. And this is an example of how we can start looking at macrophages. Um, we have the, um, the resin macrophages, the non-classical monocyte recruited macrophages, the classical monocyte recruited macrophages, and both M1 and M2. Although we probably don't want to use M1 and M2 so much anymore because um, the, that, that classification is beginning to fade out with the amount of transcriptomic data we can generate a multi-parameter flow cytometry data the M1 and M2 macrophages are, um, are, um, are shifting. So initially to look at our macrophage populations, we have a very simple gating strategy. Um, this is looking at a flow plot. We have cells from the bladder. Uh, we then want to gate on the CD45 positive immune cell population. We then want to gate on the, um, the live cells. We then want to gate on the CD11B positive cells and remove all the T cells, B cells, natural killer cells. And then finally, we want to select the F480 high, CD11B high macrophages. So this is how we generate, we get our macrophage population, both in the steady state and during a UTI. And what we now do to, to do the analysis, we have three mice in steady state, we have three mice in urinary tract infection, then we can concatenate all the files together. So we overlay it, similar to what we do, single cell transcriptomics, to understand how these populations are different. So after concatenation of the files, what we can do through flow cytometry, we have um, a series of macrophages on the left are in the steady state and on the right are in a UTI. So we know that both our macrophage populations are in the flow plots and we can actually distinguish what cells are coming from what state. We can then do a Tisney plot. And what we can see initially is we have multiple macrophage populations um, found in the bladder. As I mentioned before, macrophages are extremely heterogeneous. And this is based on 27 um, markers. And we exclude markers that I showed in a previous slide to gate on the, on the macrophage populations because they're all, um, they will be identical. And then what we can do, because we have both the steady state and the UTI, we can then divide them into two different sets. We can look at macrophages in the steady state. And what we can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and possibly seven, a very low population here. And then we can see this macrophages in the urinary tract infection where we have multiple populations. And what we can see initially from these flow cytometry plots is that we do see a, a difference to start with. This population is very distinct in the steady state and disappears during urinary tract infections. And this population here is a distinct population during UTI. And as you can see, it's a very small population in the steady state. And this population here in the, in the steady state is absent in the UTI. 
So we want to look at these further and just to show four key markers for macrophages, we look at CD68 and what we can see is the populations which are shared between steady state and UTI or CD68 high. These are CD68 intermediate high and these are CD68 intermediate. We can look at um, CD64 and we can see a very clear difference between the distinct population and steady state, which is CD64 low. However, in the UTI population, it's CD64 high. Um, looking at recruitment marker CD192, we can see that the, these macrophages here are low for recruitment. However, both the unique population, the steady state, and the UTI are CD192 high. And finally, we can look at LY6C, which is a monocyte marker. I'm going to see that this, this population is, is monocyte derived because they express um, a monocyte marker. However, the monocyte marker is not present, so these are probably not monocyte derived. So um, I want to just sort of to finally just talk about one population of macrophages, looking at cyclic F, um, on the subpopulation of macrophages in the steady state. So this is the this is the Tisney plot um, of the flow cytometry data, and this is our unique population in the steady state, population two, three, and four. And what we can do, we can look at cyclic F expression. So this is um, our unique population. We can see uh, um, cells are positive for cyclic F. And this is absent in the remaining populations in uh, the steady state. So this is quite difficult to look at on four different plots. So what we do, we can basically overlap everything. And the red line represents um, uh, all the populations two, three, and four in the steady state. This is cyclic F flow. And the blue um, filled in uh, uh, curve is basically the, the, the unique population in the, in the steady state. And what we can see is a population of uh, cyclic F intermediate and cyclic F high cells. I'm actually quite interested in these cells because um, these cells are present uh, in the sudden steady state and not an absent in UTI bladders. And we don't know whether these cells die upon a UTI infection or what happens in the lung um, alveolar macrophages, which are cyclic F positive, can uptake bacteria and other pathogens, and they can transport these to lymph nodes to prime the host immune response. So that's something that we want to look at with these macrophages. We really don't understand what these macrophages are doing. So in summary, in future directions, um, we've, we're using multi-parameter flow cytometry approaches to identify specific bladder macrophage populations in the steady state, healthy, and a UTI, which is uh, in a disease state. And by identifying these populations, we can isolate these unique populations for transcriptomic analysis and functional analysis um, to determine the role they play in tissue homeostasis and during the immune response. And to do this, um, we also want to understand where these cells are coming from, uh, how they're derived. So are these macrophages generated for, during embryogenesis by the yolk sac or fecal liver or from the bone marrow after birth? And we're investigating these macrophage subpopulations by using lineage tracing to find the source of macrophages, to look at the proliferative capacity of these macrophages, both in the steady state and response to UTI, and the rate of macrophage replenishment in the steady state and in response to, to immunological challenges. <coughs> So that's some of the future work that we're doing um, presently. Um, so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge everybody who's been part of this project. Uh, Dr. Tian Shen from John Barash's uh, group who helped with the UTIs. Um, Jenna Shavery, Isabel, Kelsey, Judy, and Anna who helped with the bladder isolation, macrophages, and flow cytometry. Uh, Dr. Garavi, Dr. Barash, Dr. Mendelson for advice and support, and NIDDK for funding through the Columbia University Opportunity Pool. Thank you very much. All right, up next is Dr. Miguel Verbitsky, and he's gonna be talking to us uh, about urine microbiota analysis and MGWAS in children with UTIs and, sorry, I'm not a urologist, vesicorectal reflux. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is hard. To so pronounce. more peds. <laughs> so how do I? Oh, it's a mask, it's a mask. Oh, this is, the mouse is very fast. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do I do presentation? Can we? Um, okay. So it's great to be here again and see you all. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to present our work. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, our work on the, this is unpublished work on the urine microbiota analysis and microbiota GWAS in children with urinary tract infections and vesicoureteral reflux, which I'm going to call VUR from now on. Um, so uh, UTIs is the, is the most common serial bacterial infection in young children. Uh, bladder and bowel dysfunction may also be important in contrib contributors to recurrence of UTIs. Um, urinary dysbi dysbiosis has been implicated in pathologic states. For example, urinary microbiota in kidney tra transplant patients show reduced, reduced bacterial diversity compared to healthy uh, individuals. And VUR is present in around one third of children with a febrile UTI and has been associated with a heightened risk of renal scarring. So our aim was to examine uh, host microbiota interactions in UTI and VUR pediatric patients. So these are two, uh, two in, our, in our study uh, from two months to 72 months of old patients, so six years old, uh, enrolled in the, in the uh, randomized intervention for children with VUR, uh, the river, and the careful urinary tract infection evaluation QT uh, studies. Um, so the river study uh, enrolled children with UTI and VUR. So the aim of the river study was to study the, uh, the utility of antibiotic prophylactic pre pre treatment uh, uh, in children with recurrent UTIs and VUR. Um, we, the samples that we, got, uh, we obtained from these studies uh, were uh, collected prior to randomization, prior to this uh, uh, antibiotic treatment that was part of the study. Uh, so that's, that's just to clarify. And the QT, QT study uh, in, uh, comprises children with UTI, but not with VUR. So they were initially, uh, uh, um, were going to be uh, enrolled in, in the river, but they were, they were excluded because they didn't have VUR. Um, so we hypothesized that the host clinical variables and genetic factors are associated with specific urinary microbiota, microbiota profiles, um, possibly because of predisposed to a specific uh, defects uh, that favor certain taxa or impact immunity. So uh, we start out from the urine sample from the river and QT uh, cohorts. Um, and so we, uh, we did a sequencing of the 16S rRNA uh, uh, genes. Uh, this is V3, V4 uh, hypervariable region. These are not, this is not long read. Um, and from there, we processed the data and we did uh, an analysis of microbiota, uh, evaluating alpha diversity and beta diversity. And these were a total of 325 uh, children. And so uh, here are the results for our microbiota analysis. On the top panels, you have alpha diversity. On the bottom panels, you have beta diversity. And I'm showing you the, uh, the, the variables that we tested, the clinical and, and demographic variables that we tested uh, that were uh, significant or nominally significant. Um, so we can see that alpha diversity uh, is reduced with, um, can you see that my pointer? No, sorry. Is this is this button? Well, on the on the left, on the top left, you see that there's a redu reduction of uh, alpha diversity with a VUR as compared with only having UTI. Uh, also, alpha diversity is reduced on the middle uh, top uh, graph, uh, the blue dots. Uh, it's reduced with, with when the children are not toilet trained. And thank you. It's uh, inversely, no, top, oh. inversely correlated with age. So uh, as, the, as the younger children have a lower alpha diversity. And we can see that these same uh, uh, variables can discriminate based on beta diversity um, uh, the, the sample. So each, each dot here is a, is a sample. Yeah. Um, so next, we obtained uh, DNA uh, from blood of the same children uh, and the intersection of these two the sample sets uh, were 278 samples for which we had both 
uh, DNA and uh, DNA from blood and urine. And so uh, on the DNA, we did whole genome genotyping and imputation. Um, and that's what we use for uh, to do um, uh, microbiota GWAS uh, on this on these uh, samples. So uh, what so what we did is um, each uh, the relative abundance. So we estimated the relative abundance for each uh, taxon, and that's the trait or phenotype that we used to uh, to run a genome-wide association study. Um, so we have as many G GWASs as uh, tax, uh, as taxa in our in our study. And what, what I'm going to show you are the again the, the our top results on these GWASs. Um, so the first one. Uh, this represents uh, our results on the abundance of pseudomonas. Um, so this is a Manhattan plot. So the, the, this is um, the minus, the minus uh, log of the p-value. So the higher the, 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 the point here is the lowest p-value. And these are the chromosomal coordinates. So we see that we have a peak on chromosome 10, a signal in chromosome 10. And uh, this is a, a regional plot. So basically zooming in in this signal. And we see that this is close to the gene CXCL12, which is also known as SDF1. So this is an interesting result. Uh, SDF1 uh, is an intram intramicrobial, antimicrobial, sorry, gene encoding uh, a stromal cell derived alpha chemokine uh, and acts as a chemo chemoattractant active on T lymphocytes and monocytes. Uh, plays a role in embryogenesis, immune surveillance, inflammation, tissue homeostasis, and cancer. Um, and it's been also associated, interestingly, with ureteric bud branching and kidney morphogenesis. So when the receptor for this uh, chemokine is blocked, you, you see a reduction in uh, here. Uh, you see a reduction in ureteric uh, uh, bud branching. Um, as a biomarker, biomarker is also been studying both uh, blood and urine. And it can differentiate between uh, false uh, false positive uh, in urinalysis from true UTIs. Um, our next uh, 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 signal, significant uh, uh, signal, uh, we found in chromosome uh, three, and again this is an interesting gene. So um, this is Robo one which is involved in multiple developmental processes. And we, it's been shown that biologic pathogenic variants in Robo-1 have been associated with syndromic uh, congenital malformations of the kidney and urinary tract. Uh, and we also uh, observe another signal in, so this, we also ran a secondary analysis on only the females of this data set. Um, the majority are, are, are girls, so there's a minority of boys in, this, in these studies. And so we ran an analysis only in females, and this is one of those uh, results. And so we found in the, in the GWAS of the gamma, pro, gamma proteobacteria, uh, a signal in chromosome 11 uh, that shows uh, that it's uh, very near WINT11. WINT11 is involved also in renal development and is expressed in urinary bud and it has been implicated in bladder tissue fibrosis in patients with patients with interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. Um, so the next thing we did is uh, a, a, a sort of replication. Um, so what we did, this is a kind of like the inverse of the, of the GWAS. Instead of testing uh, millions of, uh, the association of millions of SNPs with one phenotype, we uh, pick the top signal here So our top signal in this, uh, in the whole study, in our whole study, which is the one uh, near CXCL12. And so we test that, uh, the association of that SNP with uh, very many uh, phenotypes that we, uh, and we did this in two cohorts, the eMERGE cohort and the UK Biobank. And the, what we uh, use as, as phenotypes uh, is are the ICD codes uh, that are uh, part of the data set of these cohorts. Um, it's worth mentioning that the eMERGE cohort includes uh, pediatric patients, but the UK Biobank uh, doesn't. 
I, there's a typo there, sorry for the biobank. Um, so our top association I uh, will find in this uh, phenome-wide association study uh, was with coronary disease. And that's a known reported published association of this NIP uh, with, uh, with coronary disease. And also it's a known association of the 6CXCL12 uh, gene. Uh, and then when we looked at specifically at so you see that here the phenotypes are grouped by, by you know, system or type of, of phenotype. So when we look at gen genitourinary uh, phenotypes, and um, we found that um, there were associ suggestive associations with uh, post-operative infection, uh, functional disorders of the bladder in eMERGE, and with urinary obstruction and urinary tract infection in the UK biobank. Uh, so that kind of... Uh, uh, it's an, I think we think it's a nice uh, uh, sort of replication of our our GWASs. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, we report the first, to our knowledge, our the first combined urine microbiota analysis and microbiota GWAS in children with UTI and BUR. Uh, we show associations of bacterial taxa abundances with clinical variables and human host genetic factors. And we showed the top, our top, we found that the top SNPs in the in the lost in the lossy were on or near genes associated with immune surveillance, inflammation, and genitourinary <coughs> tract development and disease. So uh, thank you again. And I would like to thank uh, uh, all the people that uh, that were involved in this work, uh, in particular my mentor, Dr. Ali Garavi, and also uh, uh, Anne Catherine. Ullman, who they did the, uh, her lab, uh, was done all the, the, the sequencing and the processing of the urine samples, which was uh, very challenging because these were biobanked uh, samples. Uh, also, the, all the advice that we uh, that I, I got from uh, Dr. Barash and Dr. Mendelssohn and Dr. Sanakarki, and especially uh, Yask Gupta, who's a bioinformatician uh, who has uh, experience in microbiome analysis and uh, has given me a lot of advice. Uh, Pavan, who helped me with the bioinformatics too, and uh, the laboratory of Dr. Kir Luke and Atlas Khan, who uh, performed the phenome wide association study. So, thank you again. And of course, the NIDK and the O'Brien Center, uh, who has uh, uh, supported our, our work. Thank you so much. Next, we have Seth Riesner, who's going to talk to us about the infant neurobiome. This is very fast. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you to Mary Ellen for introducing many of the neurobiome concepts that um, I'll be talking about as well. So I'll try to avoid the extended background um, since some of the concepts have already, already been discussed. So I'm excited to share my research from um, my graduate school work in Maria haji Frangiscu's lab. And as you're, you'll hear from Dr. haji Frangiscu in the next talk, our lab is particularly interested in the mechanisms by which E. coli cause urinary tract infections. But we also have a very close partnership with the pediatric urologist at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And so today I'll be sharing some results from um, a study about defining the urobiome in infants. And while our study had the very specific question of whether we could determine the urobiome of infants, I'd like to extend this talk to include methods for studying the urobiome more generally. Um, I recognize that most of the audience are not microbiologists and probably are a little, maybe even a little bit skeptical about the role that the urobiome might play in the diseases that you study. Um, but I hope by sharing some of the methods and talking through how we do this, um, I might be able to convince you that you can, you too can study the role that bacteria might play in the diseases that you study. So um, an obligatory bladder urine is not sterile slide. Um, so really in the past 15, 20 years, it's come to everyone's knowledge that even in healthy people, there's bacteria that live in the bladder. And as this meta-analysis of a variety of different microbiomes show, So um, across the gut, vaginal, and urinary microbiota, there are shared taxa, um, but there are also differences. Um, and so we can see that there are unique species to each 
anatomic niche, but then there are also shared species. And so this kind of informs how we think about where these different bacteria come from um, and the roles they might be playing um, in human health and disease. And then from a functional perspective, this is a study looking at enzymes encoded by the bacteria in these different niches um, and clustering the similarity of those enzyme functions between these different niches. And as you can see, um, again, there are similarities, especially between the vagina and the bladder, um, but they are more disparate from the gut. And that is similar to what we see in taxonomic profiles as well. So in terms of methods for studying the urobiome, Mary Ellen's already talked a little bit about how we get the samples and thinking about what else might be there. Um, and because it is such a low biomass sample, we have to be careful about contaminants that can be introduced. And so I'll be talking about that a good bit throughout the talk. Um, but various studies have used a variety of approaches to collect urine um, for study. Um, superpubic aspirations, in that case, you might run into the, the contamination problem of skin flora um, from, the, from the superpubic aspiration. Transurethral catheterization is considered the gold standard for capturing the true bladder um, by microbiota, but um, it certainly is more challenging to get one of those samples because of the um, because of the procedure. Um, and then clean catch urines, you would run into the issue of having urethral contamination, urethral anaerobes, um, but those samples are much easier to obtain. Uh, in terms of analyzing it, um, we can use culture-based. So standard urine culture as used in a hospital um, is not as sensitive for low abundance species, um, but there are methods for extended quantitative urine culture where we plate more of the urine on an auger plate and try to capture more of the bacteria that are there. And then we can do the omics, so metagenomics, um, and eventually, hopefully, metaproteomics and metabolomics on um, what's in that microbiome. So we're, we were particularly working with the pediatric urologist of Vanderbilt. We were particularly interested in understanding the development of the infant urobiome um, and could we detect it early in life? And we know from a variety of other anatomic niches throughout the body, the skin, the GI tract, et cetera, um, that the development of the microbiome um, it takes a while and is influenced by a variety of factors, including beginning at birth um, and continuing throughout the lifespan. And the development of the microbiome in these various sites influences the development of the immune system, um, how we protect against infections um, and how, the, our susceptibility to diseases in the future. So our study was defining the infant urobiome and we were looking for a population of infants, otherwise healthy, no um, general urinary complications or prior diseases um, who were undergoing catheterization or in the operating room for another reason. And so we selected the population of infant males who were undergoing circumcision in the operating room. Um, and we consented their parents for sterile bladder catheterization as part of that procedure. And then we performed extended culture and 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. I'll talk a little bit about the urobiome composition and then how we can progress from understanding the, the whole community that, that's there to specific bugs and what those bugs how those bugs might be interacting in the community as a whole. Um, so we had 50 infant males. Um, the average age was around uh, four to six months of, uh, of eight years old and um, yeah, 50 males. So given this patient population and the low biomass of urine, we were particularly worried about contamination as well as saving as much volume of urine for sequencing. So we modified existing extended culture protocols to save as much urine as possible for sequencing. Um, so we took 100 microliters of urine, plated on four plates, two blood auger plates and two brucella plates, incubated those under aerobic and anaerobic conditions, and then any colonies that were identified were repurified and then identified by Mulby mass spec. Um, so the, this method in a normal, in the normal hospital, they only plate one microliter of urine. So we're plating a hundred times more. Um, and that's typical across extended culture protocols, but we are reducing the number of plates that we're using in order to preserve urine volume for sequencing. And then in terms of our, in terms of 16 s ribosomal RNA sequencing, um, Mary Ellen already talked about this a little bit, but we take metagenomic DNA and we use 60 primers that are specific to the 16S 
um, gene, a, a region of the 16S gene, amplify that, and then we're sequencing what, amp what we've amplified and using known databases and the um, phylogeny of the 16S gene, we can infer what the population distribution is. So again, thinking about the fact that it's a very low biomass sample, very prone to contamination, we wanted to include as many controls as possible to exclude the possibility that what we were detecting was from the environment and not from the bladder itself. Um, so this is, I'm gonna show a flow chart uh, through our protocol and the various negative controls that we included throughout the way. And we think that this is important going forward in the Eurobiome field to include these sorts of controls um, to because it's, again, such a low biomass sample to exclude things that might not be truly from the bladder. So within the operating room, when the patients were being catheterized, we included saline, we, we, we sequenced saline um, as well as catheter lubricant and uh, saline flushed through otherwise sterile catheters. And we have uh, four replicates of each of those negative controls. And then within our DNA extraction and 16S, amplification protocol, we have extraction blanks, PCR blanks, and mock community dilution series. These are quite standard across sequencing uh, methodologies, especially for low biomass samples, but all of these can help inform what residual DNA might be from the lab you're working in, from the kits you're using, um, from yourself, things like that. And so um, these are also important to have. And then finally, on the bioinformatics side, there's a variety of packages that allow you to remove what are presumed to be contaminants. So things that are more abundant in your extraction blanks than your true patient samples, for example, or more abundant in your catheter, uh, catheter saline flush than other samples. So getting into some of the results for our extended culture protocol. So plating 50 urines on four different plates, four different conditions, 64% um, of them grew uh, at least one colony on extended culture. There were 43 unique species. This percentage of urine culture growth on extended culture of otherwise healthy people is pretty consistent with what has been reported in the literature broadly by Alan Wolf's group and many others, 60 to 70% grow on extended culture if they don't have an infect when the patient does not have an infection. Um, there were a range of one to five unique species per sample and 28% of the 32 specimens that urine samples that grew something grew the bacteria Actinotignum shaliae, and I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the talk. So again, thinking back to methods and thinking about our negative controls, um, I, wanted, I wanted to emphasize the fact that um, uh, these are sampling controls collected from the operating room, and they have detectable DNA in them. They do not grow anything when we plate them by culture. So saline flushed through a catheter still has a fair amount of less DNA than the patient samples or less DNA reads, but still has a detectable, um, detectable reads on sequencing. It differentiates very nicely from the patient samples, which is reassuring to us that our patient samples have true microbiota there that's not just from the catheter. But I think this is a good, um, reminder that there is DNA contamination from the environment and even in the sterile catheters that we use to catheterize our patients, just because it doesn't grow something, there could still be residual DNA there that we're able to amplify and sequence. And then for our, uh, a little bit more broadly for the 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing results, um, we identified many of the taxa that are considered to be core members of the urinary microbiota across life. Um, so uh, a good proportion of actinobacteria, which Mary Ellen talked about in young boys, um, formicides, and then a quite substantial portion of proteobacteria as well. Oops. Um, so next I calculated the, what is considered a core microbiome. Um, and this is after subtracting out a lot of those negative controls. Um, we still have some things like nocardia species that are known to be, that are often considered contaminants of DNA extraction kits and things like that. So we're still refining this analysis to ensure that these are truly from the patient samples and not from some sort of contamination. The way this graph works is that in red is the prevalence. So this is out of the 50 patients, how many of them had it, had this taxa identified. 
and along the x-axis is a detection threshold. So what percent of the sample is attributed to each one? So looking at, uh, at E. coli or Escherichia, for example, um, somewhere around 80 to 90 percent had Escherichia at at least 0.01 percent uh, detection threshold. And then we can also, since we have both culture and sequencing data, we can also look at how concordant these are. Um, so this plot on the y-axis is taxonomic family, and along the x-axis is patient number. And we can, in the various colors, we can see whether it was detected by extended quantitative urine culture, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, or both. Um, I'd like to point out that um, we, have a, we have some staff being detected in both extended culture and in 16S sequencing, a good bit of Enterobacteriaceae, um, predominantly in sequencing, some in, um, some in the extended culture and in both methodologies. And then again, a, lot, a fair number of Nocardia species, but um, these again could be contaminants from the DNA extraction kit. <coughs> so the, the most common family identified, or most common species identified from the family was, was Actinotignum shalii. And so because we identified nine samples that grew actinotigum shalia, we um, performed whole genome sequencing on those nine specimens. I'll talk about that next. So actinotigum shalia was the most common species identified in our extended culture. Um, not, it's been detected in many urobiome studies in the past, and not only is it an asymptomatic colonizer of the urobiome, it's an opportunistic infectious agent of urinary tract infections. And from these papers, you can see there's a concern of an increasing incidence of actinotigum shalii urinary tract infections. It's a relatively fastidious organism to grow. So in the normal hospital microbiology lab, it wouldn't grow on the plates we normally use, so it might not be detected. Um, thus far, there's only been two whole genome sequence published. We isolated nine in our study, and so we performed whole genome sequencing of all nine of those to try to understand uh, the genes it has that might allow it to be living in the bladder. Um, so this is uh, whole genome sequencing from Actinotigum shalia showing a core genome of genes that are shared to all nine of the strains and then genes that are more variably present in the other nine of those strains. This is a phylogenetic tree and an average nucleotide identity plot showing the relationship of these strains to one another. We see that six of them are relatively similar. And then there's a group of three strains that are more disparate and are similar to themselves. After this, we looked at which antimicrobial resistance genes and potential fitness factors that these genomes encoded. And there's a lot of information here, but I'd like to point out um, two specific genes that are present in all of these, all nine of these genomes. So these are FEPDC and ENTS are genes for enterobactin uptake. Enterobactin is an iron scavenging siderophore. Um, and we know that iron is very limited in the urinary tract, but microbes need iron for their, for the ability to survive. Um, and so this is interesting that they had the transporters to uptake this iron scavenging siderophore. Um, but when we look for the genes to produce this siderophore, they don't have the genes to make it themselves. Um, and so this is a potential hypothesis and I'll kind of leave it at this cliffhanger, thinking about how we went from population level to looking at specific microbes, specific genes, and how those genes might be allowing it to interact with other microbes in the community that are also fighting for iron um, and might be producing these molecules that can help it scavenge iron itself. So in conclusion, uh, male infants have a detectable and cultural urobiome. Sampling controls, catheters, et cetera, have detectable DNA and should be considered as negative controls in all studies going forward. Um, Actinotigum shalii is a common culturable member of the human infant male urobiome. And using that as a representative example, I hope I've shown how we can move from population studies to understanding specific interactions within the urobiome. Um, we're planning to publish our, all of our analysis code and methods um, on GitHub, and we hope that this will be a resource to other people who might want to get into this sort of analysis. And then going forward from this, now that we've started to define the, micro, the urobiome in infancy, we'll move on to later stages of life throughout childhood. So I'd like to thank the members of our lab and the folks that uh, helped out with all this work, um, and I'd like to highlight that Grace, who's one of the moderators right now, has a poster later today, and then thank the Caribou 
for the P20 that finished in 2021. Thank you. All right, so up next, we have Dr. Maria Haji Frangiscu, who is my PI and also Seth's PI. So we've got a lot of great UTI stuff, but today she's gonna to be talking about how UPEC or your pathogenic E. coli subverts mitochondrial metabolism to enable intracellular bacterial pathogenesis in UTI. Thank you, Grace. Can you all hear me okay? Right, so we're gonna switch from talking about microbiome to focusing on urinary tract infection. And thank you, Chris, for having Jeopardy and telling everybody that E. coli is the primary agent of urinary tract infections, because in my lab, we look at E. coli as a pathogen in the urinary tract, and we're particularly fascinated with this. Um, let me see, where is this thing? So this one, yay. Okay, if you focus your attention over here at this black arrow, you see a bladder cell inundated with bacteria. So we're very interested in understanding how E. coli can expand into this multicellular community, which is essentially a bacterial biofilm. You can see this ball of cells here is about 800 to 1,000. We are actually now able to calculate these numbers with the help of software that Grace knows how to use, not me. But uh, how do bacteria support their growth inside a host cell? And more importantly, for this community especially, what stress is imposed to the host cell? And one of the biggest questions I had coming from the microbiology world is, why doesn't this cell die? Why doesn't it exfoliate earlier than it does? So I hope I'll provide some information about this today, um, drawing from uh, studies that we've done in vitro with bacteria. So my lab, one arm of my lab looks at development of biofilms, both in vivo that you see here and in vitro. And over the years, we have shown that E. coli biofilms, a cross section of which you see here, this was grown on um, an abiotic surface. And what you see here is a moldy image where each color is a different protein. We have shown in the past that in biofilms, these bacteria produce proteins that are spatially organized as a function of oxygen gradients. And if we zoom further in, and this is a, a confocal image of the same biofilm, and we see fluorescence in situ hybridization signals here from enzyme complexes that allow the bacteria to respire. We actually have started seeing that depending on where the bacteria are when they form these biofilm communities, they express different types of complexes that allow them to respire oxygen. So these red guys over here are expressing this quinol oxidase cytochrome BO, and these blue guys here are expressing this other cytochrome, cytochrome BD. Now I want you to remember this and associate it with blue, if you can, because I'm gonna be using this color for the rest of the talk. And what drew our attention to this is that the bacteria that express this in the biofilm are found in this sort of transitional area that is hypoxic and it has similar oxygen concentrations as the concentrations that bacteria encounter in the bladder. So the question we then asked was what of these, which of these enzyme complexes are actually used during urinary tract infections? We're taking this bacteria-centric approach. We did clean gene deletions of all the enzyme complexes that E. coli has to respire oxygen, CyO, AP, and CDAB. And I hope you can appreciate from this that the mutant that had the hardest time was the cytochrome BD mutant. It had a three log difference in colonizing the bladder. And if we follow the mice that are infected with this mutant by longitudinal urinalysis, and I'm presenting this using a Meyer Kaplan plot. Again, I hope you can appreciate that the mice infected with the mutant strain resolve ba um, bacteriuria much earlier. So that indicated to us that bacteria respire oxygen and they use this enzyme complex to do so. Now, one big bottleneck during urinary tract infection is that your bacteria have to stick to the urethelium. If they can't stick, they are peed out, right? So if we have mutants that have a problem here, we can no longer study them on the interior of the host cell. We lucked out on here. We didn't know this would happen, but deletion of this quinol oxidase enzyme, again, shown in blue, did not impair adherence 
or internalization. And what you see here in sort of reddish pink is a negative control of a mutant lacking the ability to adhere. So this gave us the indication that the defect imparted by not having this quinol oxidase enzyme was happening following internalization of the bacteria into the host cell. So if we go now into the mouse model and we do transurethral inoculation and we look at intracellular bacteria following gentamicin protection of excised bladders, I hope you can appreciate again at this one hour post-infection, which is the invasion step, whether you have this quinol oxidase shown in black or purple or not shown in blue, these guys can enter just fine. But if we follow infection over time at three or six hours post-infection, we see that the mice infected with the quinol oxidase mutant have far fewer intracellular bacteria. We can show that this is because of a defect in bacterial replication, because if we isolate bacterial DNA from the bladders and we do quantitative PCR, looking at how many origins of replication the circular chromosome has of a bacteria compared to its termini, using that ratio, we can see how many times the bacteria replicate. And the blue guys have much lower ratios, meaning they have a harder time replicating. Okay, a lot of microbiology. I'm sorry about that. Let me show you a picture. So if, uh, if, if we look at these data here, if we start looking again in our images, here's the wild type strain forming these balls of cells. Here are mutant, they cannot expand intracellularly. So why, why is this happening? E. coli is a facultative anaerobic. It could use different types of respiration. Why is this going on here? So one of the things that my student, uh, Connor Bebao, to do was to look at the literature, of course, and he realized that this quinol oxidase enzyme that bacteria have is a thousand times better at binding oxygen compared to the mitochondrial cytochrome C. So we wondered if the bacteria use this quinol oxidase to get oxygen during the um, intracellular expansion. So to do this, we used co oxygen consumption rate profiling. We looked at the uh, uh, oxygen um, amount, the amount of oxygen consumed by mock infected urothelial cells compared to uh, urothelial cells infected with UPEC. Every dot is a biological replicate. And I hope you can appreciate that the oxygen consumption rate increases in um, e infected cells. And this coincides with an increased proton leak by the mitochondria, indicating that there is a stress imposed on the mitochondrion while these bacteria are replicating. If we take again a closer look, the magenta color here is a, a mitochondrial network and we see the bacteria en encased in it. We don't know it still what that means. It doesn't need to be around the mitochondrion to get oxygen, but we, do are, we are interested in understanding what those interactions mean. But for the purposes of this talk, what we started thinking about is that if bacteria consume oxygen, and there's 800 of them in there, and only one mitochondrial network, maybe we're creating a transient gradient in oxygen that is enough to inhibit this um, hydroxylase, this um, prolyl hydroxylase enzymes that actually keep a very important hypoxia inducible factor one subunit in check. So these PhD enzymes use oxygen to catalyze a reaction that um, targets HIF-1 alpha for degradation. So we hypothesize that if the bacteria are taking oxygen away from this, even in a transient fashion, it might be enough to allow HIF-1 alpha to stabilize and increase in abundance during infection. And we've done this using immunoblood analysis. And to our amazement, we actually saw that in urothelial cells infected with UPEC, we have an increased abundance of this important transcription factor. And this 30% increase, because it's a transcriptional regulator, is enough to actually impart a dramatic shift in urothelial gene expression. I'm showing you just a snapshot. You can find the rest of the data in our publication. What I want to draw your attention is these red uh, genes here. These are all glycolysis genes. They're upregulated in UPEC infected cells. The ones that I have circled, we have validated using qPCR analysis. They're all upregulated and 
coin, um, in concert with this conversely TCA cycle, genes are downregulated. As a result, if we see this increase in glycolysis, we should see an increase in lactate <coughs> secretion. And in agreement with that, we'd have an increased external acidification rate in the tissue, in the supernate of infected tissue culture cells. And if we delete the gene cytochrome BD from the bacteria, now that goes back to uninfected rates, as you see here in the blue lines. And then if we do the oxygen consumption rate analysis, we see that in the absence of the bacterial enzyme that enables respiration, we drop the mitochondrial respiration back to uninfected stages, indicating again that one simple function of bacteria replicating actually rewires urothelial cell metabolism and changes the entire profile of the urothelial cell. Now, why isn't this cell dying? Well, aerobic glycolysis is also known as the Warburg effect. It occurs in tumor cells where HIF-1 is stabilized and one of its target sets is apoptotic suppression. So we wondered then if HIF-1 activation coincides with prevention of host cell death during UTI. To do this, we infected urothelial cells with GFP UPEC. We allowed the infection to go on and then we killed the external bacteria with gentamicin. And then we proceeded to analyze the, our cohort with flow cytometry, gating for GFP to find in urothelial cells with internalized bacteria, and also gating for annexin-5 or caspase-3 to see whether the same cells or non-infected cells had more um, um, apoptosis markers. And our results are shown here. So GFP high urothelial cells had generally lower apoptotic markers, annexin-5 and caspase-3. So in this case, apoptosis was not happening, but in GFP low urothelial cells, we had higher levels of these apoptotic markers. And remember, I said that we allow the infection to proceed and we kill the external bacteria. So previous studies in the literature had shown that exfoliation can happen in response to infection. So it happens when the bacteria are on the outside still and they kickstart a TLR4 mediated response. So what we think is actually happening here is a host pathogen immune race, an arms race essentially. If the bacteria are on the outside and the host cell initiates the exfoliation mechanism, that cell will exfoliate. However, if the cells make it in and they start replicating enough to stabilize HIF-1, then that cell is essentially co-opted and changed into a bacterial replication factory now. So this is very exciting to us because as you all probably know in this uh, room, HIF-1 is the target of many, many studies. We're interested to see in, let's say, cases where CKD anemia people are provided with uh, PhD inhibitors to stabilize HIF-1. Are those people having actually more UTIs or fewer UTIs. If you guys have any information about that or you'd like to collaborate with us, bacteriologists, we, we would love your help. I hope I've convinced you in these 15 minutes that E. coli support intracellular respiration as a function of aerobic consumption through a specific quinol enzyme. I hope I've shown you that oxygen consumption has a measurable impact on urothelial cell metabolism. And we're very interested in further understanding the role of HIF-1 during the progression of infection. And I'd like to stop by thanking all of you and our funding. Kyrie funding was very, very um, helpful here. Connor Bebau did the majority of the work and we are recruiting for this project. Thank you for your attention. So next we have Dr. Tanya Saisoeva joining us virtually. Yep. Do we have to do anything? <laughs> so, oh, okay.
for second. Hello? One sec, Tanya, if you can hear us, we're having some technical difficulties on our end. <laughs> I'm just hopefully not in my classes. <laughs> ah, perfect. Now we can hear yeah. you. All right. You're good to I, go. Okay. After this <laughs> embarrassing, I Zoom after two and a half years, I still feel that Zoom for me always brings new problems. So I do apologize to everybody. But I do want to thank everybody for your patience. And I want to thank Karibu organizers because they allowed me to present it virtually and have this nice interrupting with the speaker being muted, right? For me on my side, probably. <laughs> So I want to dive deeper, and I'm not sure if you would be repeating. I don't know which part was heard or not heard. Nothing. 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 Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll try yeah. to speed up, but I'll skip some of it. But I want to dive deeper than what Dr. Henry Francisco presented in the properties of the Europatogenic E. coli and talk about one particular severely understudied virulence factor. So, okay. I'll try not to blush too much because of being muted or doing something else around the Zoom. Um, I do skip introductory file, uh, slide presenting that UTI is a huge problem. It's a, one of the dominant bacterial infections in the world, and it's very often nosocomial, present in hospitals acquired infection. And the only strategy up until now, 2022, we still have only antibiotics to treat the infections like that. So, and that's a problem because those urinary pathogens in in particular, UPAC, E. coli strains, they are becoming increasingly multidrug resistant, meaning that antibiotics don't work. And that's the whole idea of what I'm focusing on. And I'm lucky to be sponsored by NIH and Carbo and collaborate with Dr. Kelly, Dr. Hadji Francesco, and approaching this problem of multidrug resistant UTI from different perspective, either being how that we can leverage the power of urinary microbiome and try to prevent infections, or how we can actually in, like, learn about UPAC properties, and here, I will particularly only focus on drug resistance because we know that it's now unignorable how some people eloquently put AMR and AGI is an ignorable health problem. We just don't have other options to treat these infections. And from a microbiology perspective, we do know that this resistance is spread mainly by gene transfer between bacteria, which literally means that if you have a donor pathogen or commensal strain which has some resistance plasmid with the antibiotic resistance, it can be transferred, for example, through plasmid conjugation to the recipient cell. And now we have two pathogens or so two different bacteria carrying the resistance. And that was the whole direction of the, my uh, group when I was starting, because we started to look at the drug resistance strains. We see, for example, in a collection of carbapenium resistance in uh, enteric bacteria, like a different species, that they're not empty. They don't only have in chromosomal genome. They usually contain quite a few plasmids, up to eight different plasmids. And most of them, those carrying uh, beta lactam resistance, including carbapenium resistance, are F like plasmids. And they're unique because many of them are conjugative. Those can be transferred between cells. And they encode quite a few different factors which can affect pathogenesis, including TRI-T factor. For example, now collection was over 60%. And if you look in different studies, including meta reviews um, of virulence factors in UPAC, that TRI-T was detected up to 80% of all clinical UPAC. Of course, it's different for different E. coli strains, isolated from, uh, let's say, human, animal population, different type of pathogenic E. coli. But in UPAC, it's present in almost all of them. And it's severely understudied, despite the fact that it's important for stopping the conjugation. So while the gene transfer is very rampant and bacteria can easily exchange genes, they also have natural breaks. So they have natural conjugation inhibition mechanism. For example, one of them is called so-called surface exclusion. When there's two cells, if they carry the same or very similar plasmids, they say like, no, I already have this plasmid. So they would have expressed a specific protein, TRI-T, which we focused on, which will prevent formation of the stable mating aggregates or stable aggregates. And therefore the plasmids wouldn't be donated because it's already present. So we thought originally that it would be a nice way to let's study this particular factor because if it can stop gene transfer, then we have potentially a tool to create which will stop the 
the all rampant spread of drug resistance. So we wanted to do uh, biomimicking by studying this protein. And we start reading about this and we realize that it's not only stopping conjugation from happening. Wait, I see lots of people doing, okay, hopefully it's still, I'm still heard. So, and we also um, found in literature that it's known that it's protecting from the bacteriophage uh, infection. It protects from some antibiotics and detergents and other hydrophobic molecules, like not all antibiotics. And it provides protection from an innate immunity. So from serum complement resistance, which is very important for the bacteria surviving in the blood. But the mechanism of almost none of this is known. And this is the protein which is expressed in almost all clinical UPAC isolates. And we know from literature that it's highly expressed, over 20,000 copies per cell. So it's not something to <coughs> not notice. We read more. The protein is produced as precursor. It has a signal allowing it to be transported to the outer membrane. It gets cleaved, lipidated. And this way, it's anchored on the outside of the cell when it's decorating the whole surface. And the studies come from 1984. We follow the protein family. We build a, a multiple sequence alignment to figure out which residues are conserved, which ones are variable, because we know that depending on the sequence conservation, the exclusion mechanism happens. And we wanted to figure out which part of the protein is important for one function versus another, because it is a multifunctional virulence factor. So we also know from literature from about 30, 40 years ago, that proteins as a whole, when it's anchored in membrane, capable of making stable oligomers and potentially interacting with other major outer membrane proteins, such as AMPE, which are important for many factors for UPAC. And it also was known that there is a sequence specificity of particular region, which we will call for simplicity and saga motif. And we built a model of this protein using the alpha fold prediction software, and we um, basically see that the variable regions of this protein are decorating the major core, which is really conserved and probably important for the, some of the function of this protein. So we approach this from the not even microbiological perspective. We started from in vitro studies. And the reason for that is that we don't really know for the last um, several decades nothing about this protein, and we want to figure out how it works and how it contributes to virulence of the UPAC. We created quite a few constructs and figure out that one of the construct 33 to 244 of this protein is more soluble. So we were able to express and purify this protein to over 99% uh, homogeneity. So we can actually start to analyze like how this protein interacts with something and how it um, makes complexes. The first experiment which we ran is to do so-called gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography. When we loaded purified protein with nothing else on the column, this k 70 and we see that it forms quite a few different species in the solution. So it forms mixed oligomers and we were trying to calibrate. We see that it forms dimers, trimers, so it's two subunions, three subunions, and quite a few oligomers, which are higher uh, subunit number than five. It was interesting. It was correlating with the old data, but also showing that the soluble domain, because we don't have lipids, we don't have attachment to membrane, we don't have signal, it's what driving this particular oligomerization. And then we decided to use another development of this um, alpha fold for oligomers. And with help from Dr. Stone Chen, we created the models. And alpha fold modeling shows that most likely this protein is forming ring like oligomers. One of the examples presented here is a prediction, not yet structure, but uh, very robustly with many multitude, uh, multiple repeats of this kind of modeling, we see that oligomers can be containing up to 11 of 12 subunits. So it's a quite a large complex. And that particular Nsaga motif important for conjugation is lining up the pore. So it's kind of facing outwards from the membrane. So this is my depiction of outer membrane. So present the cell surface and the ring attached on the outer membrane. So kind of fence, fence, facing the environment, apologies. And then saga motifs are in the pores facing whatever comes. So for example, you donor cells with the same plasmid. We also notice that these oligomers are extremely stable. So if we modify different soil concentration it remains in high order mixture of oligomers, but if you completely drop the salt, maybe it moves to something larger, which potentially can be aggregates or those 11, 12 subunits rings. And we also see that some of the oligomers, dimers and trimers, can persist even in denaturing SDS page electrophoresis. 
So it's something which can be cross-linked and it's really liking to be together. So not interacting with anybody else, but with themselves. Uh, we also now utilizing the power of molecular biology because we can create the specific mutants. So the first presented mutant is here. We modify the alanine from Ensaga motif to arginine, something small hydrophobic to something large and charged. And what we see that already even with this analysis on gel filtration, that alter, um, there is a strong alteration of oligomeric state uh, pushing to wild type complex in purple to partially disassemble. So it's interesting, we're working on a more site specific cross-linking methods and new directed mutagenesis to confirm whether this ring-shaped structure is actually existing in solution and in the cells. And we're starting collaboration with cryom uh, core microscopy and UAB to actually get more structure information and corroborate it with mutagenesis studies, um, whether this beautiful structure actually works in majority of UPEC strain you meet in clinics. But now we also want to use uh, more in vivo data or in cellular data with live bacteria and see how it affects the functionality of bacteria because if it's protective factor, such as, for example, protecting from complement, from serum killing, it will be extremely important, for example, for UPEC transiting from the blood or kidney infection to the bloodstream infection or urosepsis. So we did um, reestablish the quantitative assay for serum killing when we have our E. coli strains mixed with human serum or let's say rabbit serum. Uh, and then we can do those response. We can see how during the time the serum kills the pathogens. And here, the one example showing that if we use an E. coli without the plasmid or with classical F prime plasmid, then we can uh, quantify how many cells survive. When we are starting our experiment and adding 10, 30, 70 microliters of serum, and then we can start seeing that even already in small amount of serum, we have a little bit of killing, and I hope you can see my cursor, of the E. coli without plasmid, but F plasmid with tri -T expressed is protecting for 10 hundred folds, even if we increase in the concentration of serum, it's still the dark gray bar is significantly more surviving. So the log change is smaller. So we see this difference. And now we have a purified tri -T. It doesn't have all functional parts. It is and not anchored to the membrane. So just protein in solution. And we wanted to see if it would be already protective. So we adding it in trans to the cells. And in this particular case, very sensitive lab strains of E. coli, not even UPAC, which is by itself quite hardy bacteria. And what we see, that cells start to die. They die quite um, a couple orders of magnitude. And if we add tri -T just to the cells, then we are gaining protection for at least tenfold. And it works even if cells are regionally more protected by presence of the F plasmid and tri expression. If we add in purified protein, just soluble domain, it allows additive effects and cells become almost completely resistant. So, and now we're working, thanks to the new Caribo Opportunity Pool Award, on trying to establish is it actually important for the UPEC pathogenicity and serum resistance? Because when we measure something like ESBL pathogenic E. coli, we see that they're very drastically different by sensitivity to serum. They also have other virulence factors such as iron acquisition and adhesion, which we already mentioned today, but also other serum resistant factors such as capsule, bore, ISS, and they already have different LPS and LPA, which can modify <clears throat> the serum resistance. So we're working now to show what the tri-T input in that. But as I'm on time, and I'm sorry for this mishap at the beginning, I want to just to bring attention that tri-T is a very ubiquitous virulence factor in resistant UPAC. And it's very abundant protein in those pathogen cells. And it oligomerizes, and the organization is driven entirely by the extracellular domain, the soluble domain, which forms most likely in like shapes. And they are affected by different sequence specificity. And that domain is important for serum resistance. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And in particular, uh, funding from the Caribou Opportunity Pool Board, which allow us to continue the diving in and understanding how tri -T is important for UPEC and the graduate and undergraduate student working on this project. Thank you. All right, and we're gonna go into our last speaker of the session, Dr. Jonathan Barash who's going to be talking to us about hematuria, hemetabolism, and UTI.
Uh, thank you very much. So um, in all um, UTIs, in fact, in all infections, one of the most limiting um, substance is iron. And the reason that is, is that uh, bacteria require um, quite a bit of iron for DNA replication. And at the same time, the problem is most environments are pretty iron deficient. Um, iron, uh, the, the molecular form of iron, ferric iron, is essentially insoluble in water. And um, the presence of phosphate buffers, the KSP is even lower, which you see here. So this is a blot of uh, patient samples, uh, E. coli from patient samples, and um, done by uh, Anne Katrine Ullman at our institution. And what she is able to do is examine uh, the presence of these uh, genes that you see on the y-axis. The top three genes have to do with the recovery of heme from the environment. It's CHUA, HAMA, and uh, CHUS. Uh, the rest of the genes have to do with the production of what are called siderophores, which are organic molecules that bacteria use to uh, capture elemental iron, ferric iron, rather than heme iron. And while we can't say that every UTI is unique, uh, this plot really shows us um, something that is pretty incredible, that UTIs are very diverse in their uh, nutritional uh, apparatus, uh, able to cause their growth. In fact, these over here, these bacteria represented in this end of the graph, um, express enterochelin, which you heard about in a previous talk, uh, but few other, actually no other siderophores and not heme transport itself, whereas many of the bacteria have, have heme transport. A UTI-89 and CFT-073, you know, our favorite bacteria here, are full house. They express both heme transport and essentially every other siderophore, at least on this map. Um, I haven't, this is not an exhaustive image. There's, this could be at least tenfold uh, bigger. This chart could be tenfold bigger if we had screened all of the um, known siderophore enzymes and so on. So yes, uh, iron is a growth factor for bacteria. So the um, two plus iron, here's a dose response for growth. Uh, three plus is even better because it's siderophores are ferric targeted, not ferrous targeted. Um, and in fact, when bacteria show up into the urine, they induce local damage and the shedding of iron into the urine. And uh, what happens is that in the bladder, there is a response uh, to the uh, bacteria and to the presence of iron. And that is um, iron chelators are created. One is lactoferrin. Uh, this one, a molecule that I discovered, Engal, is a protein that binds to siderophores that actually block the transmission to some forms of bacteria. And here's, here's Engal being expressed by the urothelium uh, four hours after an infection. But heme also has a growth activity, and it's very nice. This is the chu hama knockout bacteria from uh, Hank Mobley, and they're less responsive than the wild type bacteria. It is heme itself. It's not Billy, Rub Billy Verdon or Billy Rubin. It's actually the fully loaded heme with its iron that is uh, required for that growth effect. Um, the, um, if you load a mouse with heme in the urinary system, you get more growth of bacteria. You can see the heme is present on the dipstick and more growth of bacteria. If, he, if uh, bacteria show up and uh, cause damage, maybe it's hemolysin in about a third of the cases, but, or, or cellular damage or, or damage to red blood cells, uh, you see a spike of heme in the urine and you see a whole group of, of heme binding proteins that appear at the same time. Um, this system seems very much parallel to the one I talked about just a moment ago with the siderophore binding and ferric iron binding, because again, the uh, urothelia has a, has a role in defeating these species of iron. But the heme system seems to be quite a bit more complicated and attracted my attention for, for a variety of reasons. Hematuria obviously is, a is one of the standard old time clinical tools to diagnose a UTI. It's present in, it goes up three to five fold in the presence of a UTI. And the other thing is that even without a UTI at baseline, we pass about 3 million red blood cells a day, which contain enough iron to grow a 10 to the 10 uh, bacteria, in fact. So at baseline, there is a, at baseline, we have hematuria in, in normals and UTI increases it. And so the questions of, of elemental iron and uh, siderophore biology is really a very small piece of the total amount of iron fluxing through the system, it's mostly heme. So we have to think about defense against heme, which uh, 
has gotten me into, into deep into a biology that I wasn't expecting. So in the surface epithelia here, what we see is the expression of a protein called HRG1 or SLC48A1. It's the only known uh, heme importer having been discovered by Iqbal Hamza. And you can see it's an endosomes of these superficial cells. So it looks like the urothelia is able to capture heme and transport it into the cytoplasm. In fact, one of the best markers of, in fact, heme transport into cytoplasm is the expression of the hemox, uh, famous uh, um, hemoxygenase protein. And you can see it's so beautiful. The RNA is so specific to the urothelium. Um, this is uh, in female and below and in male. And suggesting that heme is actually entering uh, in, this, in the setting of a UTI or potentially internally displaced from mitochondria and other sources. But hemox wakes up. And um, hemox has a function of splitting heme. And so the, actually the best way to tell that the system is an active system in the urothelium is to actually examine uh, the splitting of heme, which generates three products, biliverdin, iron, and uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, a single carbon fragment is released. So to see that, we invent this probe here that is two fluor molecules bound to palladium that are quenched but carbon monoxide displaces, and we synthesize this, uh, this probe, displaces it and gives you a fluorescence, which you can see here responding to carbon monoxide donors, not to NO donors. And here are bacteria themselves. If you feed bacteria trace amounts of heme, voila, you see carbon monoxide being released. Uh, this is how bacteria may control their population density. Certainly CO is a bacteriostatic agent. It's not cytal, but it's a bacteriostatic agent. So what about the urothelium? So when we take bladders from, from animals that have had a UTI, we see carbon monoxide being generated. So um, these data, both the importer HRG1, the met metabolic enzyme hemoxygenase, the release of carbon monoxide tells us that urothelium is, is a very active place for heme metabolism, which, which is appealing given the, given the idea that we're passing red blood cells continuously and it's involved in it. Uh, UTI is an accelerant. Um, that's where the beautiful story is nice. It's nice and, and round and, and I think can be solved um, with a lot more experiments, but there's so much complexity here that we, we found and, and learned from all of you from the literature and from our own experiments. So the, the female and the male have a very temporally different uh, distribution. If we go back to uh, heme oxygenase back here, uh, you can see that the female generates hemoxygenase very rapidly and very intensely. The male wakes up later in the course of a UTI. And so this, this made us go back and really examine uh, bladders over time in male and female, and to look at the shedding of cells, which are decorated here in the white color for cytokarin uh, 20. And you can see that females really start shedding four to eight hours. Eight hours is about a 50% loss of urothelial cells by 12 hours. It's, it's really robust and almost complete. And males is somewhere between eight and 12. By 12, you begin to get much more shedding. So there's a temporal difference that our experiments are gonna have to incorporate. Um, knowing that, and that took two years of work, no, knowing that we were able to go back in time and actually look at the HRG knockout. So remember, this is the protein that causes the influx of heme into the cells through endosomes. When we knock it out, we see beautiful protection of the urothelial layer. These cells, while geared to take up heme and geared to metabolism, do not want heme entered, at least in the setting of a UTI, because when you knock out the entry protein, you're protective. Now, if heme does get into the cytoplasm, one absolutely wants to be able to get rid of it as quickly as possible. We want to exclude it. And if it enters, we want to get rid of it. If you knock out heme oxygenase, a very difficult colony to raise. But if you, if you do this, you see that relative protection and wild type, and you completely lose it completely uh, in a heme oxygenase. The cells just shed right, right off, probably some at baseline, but then during the UTI quite a bit. Um, so, these, so this model has taught us that there's a heme processing events, and simultaneously the knockouts tell us that these uh, molecules are essential and, and that this is a system um, that is uh, poised for, uh, for a lot of trouble. Um, to put this into context of, of UTI and, and the work that everyone has studied in this area, and for the complexities of heme, we, we have to go to other systems and introduce them into our lab. 
Um, you know, it's possible to simply pick up the urothelium off the bladder surface. It's like picking up a wet piece of toilet paper with a forceps. You just pull it right up and you can do experiments with it, such as look at cytokine expression, which is way high in that heme oxygenase knockout. Um, more interestingly, we can pull out RNA that's de novo expressed in the urothelium by simply using this mouse that we developed. It, it labels nascent RNA through this enzyme. Um, and it does so, it labels it with thiouracil. So you're able to decorate nascent RNA within the urothelium and pull from an entire bladder. You don't have to do any dissection, any isolation. You just from an entire bladder, just pull out the RNA, the nascent RNA species uh, from the urothelium itself because you've used a Cree that's urothelial specific to activate this enzyme. And the timing of that is up to you whenever you want to inject thiouracil. So doing that, we have genes that we now find are very, very reproducible from animal to animal. In red, the iron genes. In yellow, the heme genes. A pathway analysis shows inflammation and iron. And if you use, uh, if you just dose with heme itself, it, it enhances the iron story with the circadian clock genes uh, coming, but also inflammatory uh, conditions. And Genes like BAC1 and ferritin and heme oxygenase are co-expressed in these models reproducibly. So we have to put all this into context. It's a, it's a, it's a massive amount of uh, data. Um, you, you know, for example, this is a, these are the clock genes and NPAS and BMOL uh, expressed in the UTI, robustly in the female, much less so in the male. And it turns out that my work was essentially prefigured and was just sort of hiding. And it was obvious in the databases that these massive heme intake importers and metabolism and cleanup enzymes were actually published in databases way before I got to any of this. So here's my uh, summary and what, what I need to do to, to put this in, into real context. What the data shows is that UTI requires iron. That's unequivocal. Uh, wild type iron levels in the urine or uh, in the urinary system are simply not saturating. We can up or down down increase them by by any number of mechanisms. There are different species of iron. The urothelia generates defenses against these different species of iron, and that the heme um, metabolic system requires a tremendous effort to really uh, and many many genes to get it to work. Uh, these genes are protective. Um, uh, heme oxygenase is certainly protective, but the import of heme is, is quite toxic to the system. What we think is happening is that a UTI enhances the degradation step by inhibiting BAC1, which is an inhibitor, and then heme oxygenase wakes up, generates carbon monoxide, which turns off the biosynthesis of heme. Heme is degraded, no longer biosynthesized, the heme levels de uh, decrease in the cell, eventually BAC1 rebinds and heme synthesis reoccurs. We have to put our data in the context of timing. Lastly, we have to have a description and ask ourselves a very hard question as to whether heme systems are really involved in the shedding of urothelial cells. We had to go to the kidney to do this because we needed a large amount of tissue that takes up heme and the kidney does it. This paper is in the review process. There are two cycles of damage. One is the phoroptosis step and the second step is called NOx4 mediated a hydroxy radical production. Heme is the center player of both of these loops. And we suspect that the uptake of heme, the reason it's so toxic, is because it's activating phoroptosis, then followed by necroptosis uh, later on. So my last slide is the bladder epithelia is metabolically active. It deactivates heme, probably as part of an immune defense or part of steady state balance because of all the red cells there but this process may lead to its own death, which I like to think is almost altruistic in the system in some way. Thank you very much.